Fahrenheit 451, Part 1, The Hearth and the Salamander. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed, with the brass nozzle in his fist, with this great python spitting its venomous kerosene upon the world, the blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor, playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. With this symbolic helmet, numbered 451 on his stolid head, and his eyes all orange flame with the thought of what came next. He flicked the igniter, and the house jumped up in a gorging fire that burned the evening sky red and yellow and black. He strode in a swarm of fireflies. He wanted, above all, like the old joke, to shove a marshmallow on a stick in the furnace, while the flapping pigeon-winged books died on the porch and lawn of the house. While the books went up in sparkling whirls and blew away on a wind, turned dark with burning. Montag grinned his fierce grin of all men singed and driven back by flame. He knew that when he returned to the firehouse, he might wink at himself, a minstrel man, burnt corked in the mirror. Later, going to sleep, he would feel the fiery smile still gripped by his face muscles in the dark. It never went away, that smile. It never, ever went away as long as he remembered. He hung up his beetle, his black beetle-colored helmet and shined it. He hung his flame-proof jacket neatly. He showered luxuriously and then, whistling, hands in pockets, walked across the upper floor of the fire station and fell down the hole. At the last moment, when disaster seemed positive, he pulled his hands from his pockets and broke his fall by grasping the golden pole. He slid to a squeak squeaking halt, the heels one inch from the concrete floor downstairs. He walked out of the fire station and along the midnight street toward the subway where the silent air-propelled train slid soundlessly down its lubricated flue in the earth and let him out with a great puff of warm air onto the cream-tiled escalator rising to the suburb. Whistling, he let the escalator waft him into the still night air. He turned the corner, thinking little at all about nothing in particular. Before he reached the corner, however, he slowed as if a wind had sprung up from nowhere, as if someone had called his name. The last few nights he had had the most uncertain feelings about the sidewalk just around the corner here, moving in the starlight toward his house. He had felt that a moment prior to his making the turn, someone had been there. The air seemed charged with a special calm, as if someone had waited there quietly, and only a moment before he came, simply turned to a shadow and let him through. Perhaps his nose detected a faint perfume. Perhaps the skin on the backs of his hands, on his face, felt the temperature rise at this one spot, where a person standing might raise the immediate atmosphere ten degrees for an instant. There was no understanding it. Every time he made the turn, he saw only the white, unused, buckling sidewalk, with perhaps, on one night, something vanishing swiftly across a lawn before he could focus his eyes or speak. I want you to now summarize for me what has happened so far in the text. Now what did you note in your two column chart? So let's look at the questions on the slide. What does this language reveal about Montag? What does this language reveal about his profession? How does Bradbury describe Montag's reaction to his job? What is different about a firefighter's responsibilities in this society? Let's discuss.
Now read along as we read aloud pages 3 through 7. I want you to consider Clarissa's words, thoughts, action, and impact on Montag. And then take notes about this in the Evolution of Montag handout. But now tonight, he slowed almost to a stop, his inner mind reaching out to turn the corner for him. He had heard the faintest whisper. Breathing? Or was the atmosphere compressed merely by someone standing very quietly there, waiting? He turned the corner. The autumn leaves blew over the moonlight, moonlit pavement in such a way as to make the girl who was moving there seem fixed to a sliding walk letting the motion of the wind and the leaves carry her forward. Her head was half bent to watch her shoes stir the circling leaves. Her face was slender and milk white, and in it was a kind of gentle hunger that touched over everything with tireless curiosity. It was a look, almost, of pale surprise. The dark eyes were so fixed in the world that no move escaped them. Her dress was white and it whispered. He almost thought he had heard, he heard the motion of her hands as she walked and the infinitely small sound now, the white stir of her face turning when she discovered she was a moment away from a man who stood in the middle of the pavement waiting. The trees overhead made a great sound of letting, their rain, letting down their dry rain. The girl stopped and looked as if she might pull back in surprise, but instead stood regarding Montag with eyes so dark and shining and alive that he felt he had saw, said something quite wonderful. But he knew his mouth had only moved to say hello, and then she seemed hypnotized by the salamander on his arm and the phoenix disc on his chest. He spoke again. Of course, he said, you're our new neighbor, aren't you? And you must be, she raised her eyes from his professional symbols, the fireman. Her voice trailed off. How oddly you say that. I'd, I'd have known it with my eyes shut, she said slowly. What? The carrot smell of kerosene? My wife always complains, he, he laughed. You never wash it off completely. No, you don't, she said in awe. He felt she was walking in a circle about him, turning him end for end, shaking him quietly and emptying his pockets without once moving herself. Kerosene, he said, because the silence had lengthened, is nothing but perfume to me. Does it seem like that, really? Of course. Why not? She gave herself time to think of it. I don't know. She turned to face the sidewalk going toward their homes. Do you mind if I walk back with you? I'm Clarice McClellan. Clarice. Guy Montag. Come along. What are you doing out so late wandering around? How old are you? They walked in the warm, cool, blowing night on the silvered pavement, and there was the faintest breath of fresh apricots and strawberries in the air, and he looked around and realized this was quite impossible so late in the year. There was only the girl walking with him now, her face bright as snow in the moonlight, and he knew she was working his questions around, seeking the best answers she could possibly give. Well, she said, I'm 17 and I'm crazy. My uncle says that the two always go together. When people ask your age, he said, always say 17 and insane. Isn't this a nice time of night to walk? To walk? I like to smell things and look at things and sometimes stay up all night walking and watch the sunrise. They walked on again in silence and finally she said thoughtfully, you know, I'm not afraid of you at all. He was surprised. Why should you be? So many people are, 
afraid of firemen, I mean. But you're just a man, after all. He saw himself in her eyes, suspended in two shining drops of bright water, himself dark and tiny in fine detail, the lines about his mouth, everything there, as if her eyes were two miraculous bits of violet amber that might capture and hold him intact. Her face, turned to him now, was fragile milk crystal with a soft and constant light in it. It was not the hysterical light of electricity, but what? but the strangely comfortable and rare and gently flattering light of the candle. One time, as a child, in a power failure, his mother had found and lit a last candle, and there had been a brief hour of rediscovery of such illumination that space lost its vast dimensions and drew comfortably around them, and they, mother and son alone, transformed, hoping that the power might not come on again too soon. And then Clarice McClellan said, Do you mind if I ask how long you've been, how long you've worked at being a fireman? Since I was 20, 10 years ago. Do you ever read any of the books you burn? He laughed. <laughs> That's against the law. Oh, of course. It's fine work. Monday burn Malay, Wednesday Whitman, Friday Faulkner. Burn them to ashes, then burn the ashes. That's our official slogan. They walked still further, and the girl said, Is it true that long ago firemen put fires out instead of going to start them? No. Houses have always been fireproof. Take my word for it. Strange. I heard once that a long time ago, houses used to burn by accident, and they needed firemen to stop the flames. He laughed. She glanced quickly over. Why are you laughing? I don't know. He started to laugh again and stopped. Why? You laughed when I haven't been funny, and you answer right off. You never stop to think what I've asked you. He stopped walking. You are an odd one, he said, looking at her. Haven't you any respect? I don't mean to be insulting. It's just that I love to watch people too much, I guess. Well, doesn't this mean anything to you? He tapped the numerals 451, stitched on his char-colored co sleeve. Yes, she whispered. She increased her pace. Have you ever watched the jet cars racing on the boulevards down that way? You're changing the subject. I sometimes think drivers don't know what grass is, or flowers, because they never see them slowly, she said. If you showed a driver a green blur, oh yes, he'd say, that's grass. A pink blur? That's a rose garden. White blurs are houses, brown blurs are cows. My uncle drove slowly on a highway once. He drove 40 miles an hour, and they jailed him for two days. Isn't that funny? And sad, too? You think too many things, said Montag un uneasily. I rarely watch the parlor walls or go to races or fun parks, so I have lots of time for crazy thoughts, I guess. Have you seen the 200-foot-long billboards in the country beyond town? Did you know that once billboards were only 20 feet long, but cars started rushing by so quickly they had to stretch the advertising out so it would last? I didn't know that, Montag laughed abruptly, but I know something else you don't. There's dew on the grass in the morning. He suddenly couldn't remember if he had known this or not, and it made him quite irritable. And if you look, she nodded at the sky, there's a man in the moon. He hadn't looked for a long time. They walked the rest of the way in silence, hers thoughtful, his a kind of clenching and uncomfortable silence in which he shot her accusing glances. When they reached her house, all its lights were blazing. What's going on? Montag had rarely seen that many house lights. Oh, just my mother and father and uncle sitting around talking. It's like being a pedestrian, only rarer. My uncle was arrested another time, did I tell you, for being a pedestrian. Oh, we're most peculiar. But what do you talk about? She laughed at this. Good night. She started up her walk. Then she seemed to remember something and came back to look at him with wonder and curiosity. Are you happy? She said. Am I what? He cried. But she was gone, running in the moonlight, her front door shut gently. <laughs>